Welcome to another Rock and Roll World Trip. I'm Sammy Hagar, and I'm sitting here with a guy that's got more identity than anybody on the planet. This is one of them guys you say, well, he's got his own style. No, it's more than that. This guy invented his own style. He is his own style. Whatever all that means, Mr. George Thorogood is on the show with me today, and he's already telling me stuff. I, I <laughs> Anyway, George, thanks for doing the show. That was the most professional I'm going to be. Oh, okay, Ooh. good. You're off to a good start. Now that the intro is over. Am I really all those things you just said? Yeah, I think oh. so. No, you've got... You, I'm liking you more and more. You're such a stylist. Like, how do you become that? Did you, did you never play other people's songs, or did you just, like, wake up in the morning and, and that's the way you sounded and play? Because, I mean, you're, you're more of a stylist than so many it, people. It wasn't, out, it wasn't out of design. I played, when I first started playing the guitar, I'm uneducated on the guitar. I virtually had no guitar lessons. Yeah. And my style was uh, very raw, very off the meter. Um, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, but I listened to primarily blues records to learn the instrument. Um, I was learning the blues playing as I was learning the instrument itself. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Lockwood once said to me, um, he said, you, you, you remind me of John Lee Hooker. You, 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 play, you play correctly. I said, I do. He said, why? Because you play wrong. <laughs> I'm a big John Lee guy. Well, see, so I was, was, I was working hard at trying to make it sound. like So, so my style was very... Pretty primitive, pretty, uh, pretty raw to begin with. And when I do that, people say, oh, that kid, he's always trying to make it sound authentic. And our bass player, Bill Blau, would say, no, this is George trying to clean up his act. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is as good as it's Trying good. to get good. <laughs> yeah. We're just trying to get good. Right. But so John Lee, people like that, your influence. That's what I was going to ask you. I mean, who'd you grow up listening to? Well, I, 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 my, uh, my first uh, rock and roll hero was the same as everybody else's. Same as yours and mine. Elvis. But I can't say his name right. It was either Mick Richards or Keith Jagger. Oh. Whoever that guy is. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah, well, you opened for the Stones once. Was that intimidating you know, or was that exciting or was that like, did you make friends? No, Sammy, I hated every minute of it. Really? It a, no, come on. Oh, I, Are you play with the Rolling Stones? Are you oh, kidding that's me? That's what I'm saying. It's Keith's my, my hero. It's well, my dream, man. You know, that they were so pleasant to me. They, uh, they said, people would say, you open for the Stones. And when I'd say that, Almost to a man, everybody in the stone said, no, you're not the opening act. You're on the bill. You're on the show. You just have to be wow. playing first. That's how classy they were. They said, no, there's, there's no opening act. Wow. You're on the show with us. And that was, uh, that meant a lot to me. You know, that meant a lot. They were, uh, they, they couldn't have been nicer. So when you ask, what was it like? It was like my birthday and Christmas morning rolled into one. It was, <laughs> it was like the first day of summer vacation. Wow, what a trip. I, the thing that, you know, growing up, you and I, our career is pretty parallel, you know, and we, and we have really never hung around together. I ask all my friends, I mean, country guys, old classic rock guys, anybody. I say, yeah, we're going to do George Thurgood, you know, and, uh, and I say, you don't know anything? You know, what's he like? You guys there, go, man, I've never hung with George. And everybody tells me you're like this recluse or something. You don't hang out. What's up with that? Well, I don't want to say that. It's just that, uh, hmm. Yeah. Someone once said about George, they said, well, George is the kind of person... He likes a crowd in front of him, not a crowd around him. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's profound as shit. Yeah. I'm totally digging that. Yeah. You know, I'm proud of you, though. You've kept, really kept a long, a long career. And the craziest thing that's most impressive to me is, you know, record companies my whole life, being a solo artist, like mm -hmm. kind of you are, you have a band, but you're a solo artist. But the point is, is that solo artists, they always put pressure on you, you need a hit, you need a hit, you need a hit, you need mm -hmm. a hit. Mm -hmm. And you've had freaking hits out of songs that if I would have given to my record company, they would have rejected it. They'd say, you, you can't get this on the radio. This is down home, up blues, you know, rocking <clears throat> crazy, uh, uncommercial music, you know, mm -hmm. long songs. Mm -hmm. How the hell did you craft that or did that shit just happen by Well, accident? I came from the era and time when uh, it, they, around 67, 68, People started to shy away from saying we just want to hit a top forty hit, and people made albums yeah. all the way. Now you got to agree with me that you're ne you're going to rarely find an album that's fantastic all the way through, like like Moondance is, all the way through. So record companies were going to say no, we want to put out a good record as opposed to the top forty hits. So that's when I came along. That was my time. Well, it was a time of the Almond Brothers yeah. and Johnny Winter, and Elvin Bishop, and they made really great records, and we'd put them on and listen to the whole thing. And then yeah, but you over. went on past that. Well, what happened was un time. unexpectedly, it wasn't by design, somehow FM radio, just before it closed out, picked up bourbon scotch in here and played it on the radio. Now, I never expected that, Sam, in a million years. Amen. Never. I'll drink to that. I was <laughs> like, I was like uh, you're blowing it for me. 
I'm supposed to be an underground artist here. What are you, what are you doing to me? Hey, you know, it's still, you hear your big four all the time. I was fooling around with this song in sound checks, not in our shows, during the tour um, with this song. And I'm, I'm walking backstage and I'm, I'm getting ready to go on. And this, this man comes up to me and, and he says, introduces himself and he says, are, are you writing any songs? Because I was known for not writing songs. I said, actually I am. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put some stuff together. And he said, well, if they're anything like Bone, you're going to do all right. <laughs> and I said, how, how do you, you mean Bad of the Bone? He says, yeah. And I said, well, how, how do you know about that song? Because nobody knew it. And he goes, George, it's my job to, to know it. By the way, I'm David Geffen. Oh, shit. Here. Hi, David. I said, David, okay. David signed me to my first big record. Well, I'm huh? saying, he's saying to me, wow. you're, 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 yeah, you're on the right track. Yeah, exactly. This guy was. I had just met him. He had instincts, And man. he just was there, and he was just, he was so relaxed about it. said, you know, I really don't have much more to tell you. But it was that song and our performances with the Stones that got those labels interested. The tune helped. Yeah. They, they, they. they they saw things that I didn't see. What's they're supposed to? Yeah. That's what the record is. Yeah, some of it's, you know. Yeah. They're supposed to have more, even more vision than the artist. We've had really, really amazing um, musical luck in this business to get to be get away with the yeah. type of music you play. Yeah. Not because you don't like it. I'm saying it's yeah. just not what you call here's pop where, music. Here's where the, here's where the, you've had the luck hits. factor happens. I, I look at it both ways, Sam. Um, there, you can only rely on luck so much because bad luck's waiting for you. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta make your own good luck. Good luck. We're you writing got, a song right now. Good bad luck. You gotta ma make happen. Yeah. You gotta make. You know, like I say, the pursuit of happiness. You right place go at the right time. If you just sit back and wait for something lucky to happen to you, you, you people who believe in 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 good in only to be lucky are people who end up not being lucky. Because you can't rely on that. Yeah. Okay, so no, we, you can't. we sat down and said, no, this is a song somebody's going to like. And I started thinking, look, I'm never going to make anybody forget about Jeff Beck's guitar playing. I'm never going to make anybody forget about Beverly Sills singing. What, do you have, what, do you, what, what should you do? And I started thinking, do you know how big a hit King of the Road is? Oh. Do you know how big a hit Boy Named Sue is? Now, you don't yeah. have to be Roger Daltrey yeah. to sing those songs. But people remember a hit. They remember the tune more than I said. Do you want to be remembered for having about a half a dozen groovy songs, or do you want to be remembered as a guy who was pretty good at playing imitating Chuck Berry? See, I'm like, <laughs> well. So I started going after songs and saying, "Bourbon Scotch and Beer" is a hit. It's going to be a hit no matter who does it. So I'm going to do it. Um, moving on over, I, I I was this close to saying, "We got to get into the studio and do moving on over." Why? I said because Linda Ronstadt will find it, get the Eagles yeah. a back her up, and she and they'll blow me right out of the water. <laughs> She'll get a pedal yeah, steel, Hank and it'll Williams, be terrific. Hank Williams, a gold mine still. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. So that's what I was going after for day one and saying, I, I want to come up with the groovy tunes. How in the heck do you keep a band together 45 years? That's a feat in itself. I mean, being a, and it's called George, oh, I pay good. Really? You need a, <laughs> you need a bass player or anything? <laughs> <laughs> Side band on it? <laughs> Uh, that's a good, that's a good, I, I believe you must. Well, aside from it's probably has something to do with, uh, it's exciting, but probably the top thing is we keep everyone there because, because of my charming, glowing personality. Is that right? I, I, I used to say this, people have said that past, uh, in the past it said, you know, about the payroll of, of what we do with people. Mm -hmm. And I've had, uh, accountants who have said, well, you're, you're, you're paying this person a little too much. And my theory on that was. There is no price on loyalty. You can't put a price on it. Yeah. So that's my reward, saying, you know, for, for doing that. Just give them a little extra. Just give them a, give them a little, you know, extra there. You're a good man. You know, uh, that'll, that'll keep them on the team. You're a good man. I think it's so important that if you find good guys in any industry, in any business, your business, mm -hmm. your, your, you can't, your garden. You can't live on compliments. No, no, no. <laughs> well, Ike Turner used to do it with cocaine. I heard him say, okay, here's your eight ball. <laughs> that don't work. So here we are in Memphis at the Graceland. Mm -hmm. Elvis, the king. Maybe the, in my opinion, maybe the biggest star ever on the planet. You know? Arguably, yeah. yeah. And um, Nobody ever says Elvis who. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Willie's getting that way, too, you know? <laughs> like, Willie? Nelson? Yeah. Um, what did, what did Elvis mean to you growing up, or what is Elvis? Elvis freaking Presley. When, when Elvis Presley hit, you gotta understand, I was I was young, very young. I was like seven or eight. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. When I was when Elvis hit, 
Um, they were talking about rock and roll. Because I was so young, I did not know rock and roll was a new thing. I thought it had been around forever. Yeah, and that was you just seeing it. For I, the I was first just hearing everybody else was like yeah. this new thing. I go, well, what's, what's so new about it? It's just um, I wasn't until years later they said no. Right when you started growing up in the fifties, mid or early fifties, that's when rock and roll hit. It hit when you hit. Yeah. So you would just think it's a natural thing, you know. So I I never knew that when Elvis Presley came along, we could feel the vibrations of Elvis Presley. Right in northern Delaware on Clearview Avenue where I live. I mean, you, you could, the, the guy was sh literally shaking the, the, the planet. Uh, he, he, his, his, he shook my house. He was powerful. Well, you understand, he was so powerful. You understand when Elvis Presley started, when people like him or Chuck Berry or the people who created rock and roll, remember, they were the first, so they had no idols to look at to say, I want to do what Mick Jagger does. Yeah, yeah. I want to do what Jimi Hendrix does. They were the first. So Elvis didn't have any... He, he was he was up there on a tightrope without a net. He had a hammer and a chisel. Man. He, he was making. They, they yeah. were looking at him and saying, "Well, who are your influences? How are your influence when you're only 19?" He's just, you know what I mean. He was yeah. just doing it. They all were like that. Yeah, now, killer. when the Beatles came along, they had idols. They idolized Little Richard and Elvis yeah. and Chuck, Chuck Berry, and they formulated something. And they actually had incredible confidence to sit there and say, "We're going to be bigger than Elvis Presley." Now, that's a heck of a thing to say. It's another thing to believe it, and then another thing to do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Rock and Roll Road Trip. I'm Sammy Hagar, just George Thurgood and the Destroyers, and we're going to destroy you. You lead it off. You, oh, kick off the ball. We'll kick it off. Not I'll kick it off for there you. There you go. You, you come in when you want to, Boom. all right? I come in last night about a half oh. past ten. That baby of mine wouldn't let me in. Move it on. Oh. Rock it on over. Rock it on over. She changed the lock on my back door Now my key don't fit no more You gotta move it on over Move it on over Rock it on over Rock it on over Move over the door Cause I mean old dogs put in Back to me begging on her knees Meanwhile I'll be scratching these Move it on over Move it on over Rock it on Gotta move it on over, huh? Move it on over. You gotta rock it on over. Rock it on over. Well, move the big dog, cause you'll be no dogs moving in. Something like that, George. We're getting close now. She'll come back to me, begging on her knees. Meanwhile, I'll be scratching, please. We're moving on. Dogs moving.